Well, do keep your Bibles open at page 1177 on that passage from Ephesians. Uh, I believe, David, correct me if I'm wrong, this is the last in our series of uh, the posture. Yes, it is. I've got the thumbs up. So we've been going through this uh, uh, mini-series on how is your posture, and we've looked at things like walking with the Lord, sitting uh, with the Lord, and this one is on standing in the strength of the Lord. That's what we're looking at uh, this evening. A number of years ago, I read an article about someone who joined the British Army, and a year after he joined, the British troops were then sent to Iraq in 2003 to fight against Saddam Hussein. The soldier decided to leave the army, and when he was asked why, he said this, well, I didn't join the army to be shot at. Well, I have to say that there was a man who was rather unrealistic about what he had actually signed up for. He might have thought that uh, joining the British Army simply meant going off on training exercises, firing a few blanks at your friends, rather than encountering real bullets in combat against a hostile enemy. He didn't realize that there could be real casualties where people could be wounded or even killed. Friends, the moment you become a Christian, you enter a war, a war zone with a real enemy, Satan. The Apostle Paul knew this all too well. Indeed, the moment you become a Christian, the devil puts a target on your back and you will come under his fire. The devil will use all kinds of tactics to try and silence you, to discourage you, or to attack you. Anything to stop you from growing as a believer and spreading the gospel and winning more people to Christ. That is precisely why Paul, in our passage here, asks for prayer for boldness. Look down to verse 19 and 20. He says this, Pray also for me, that whenever I speak, words might be given to me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I might declare it fearlessly as I should. It's remarkable that despite being imprisoned for his faith, his prayer request isn't, oh, please pray that I get free. No. Pray, please pray that I will be fearless in order to keep making known the liberating power of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which alone has the power to free people from hell. As Christians, friends, we face a real enemy, but God provides us in these verses with his resources so that we might take our stand against him. Now, the Ephesian believers Paul was writing to had grown up in an extremely superstitious culture. Many people in Ephesus lived in great fear of spiritual powers, and they took seriously the threats of curses being cast upon them. I have preached in India several times, and I can honestly relate to this because there were some villages in India where you could tangibly sense the change in atmosphere in the villages where demons were worshipped. Friends, the forces of evil are very real. But Paul wanted these Ephesian Christians to know that God is all-powerful. Jesus holds all dominion. And so the very first thing that we need to take our stand against the devil is to rely entirely upon God's power and ultimate victory over Satan. Look down at verse 10. Finally, he says, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Now, this passage doesn't say, be strong in the power of yourself. 
So this is not some self-help, self-confidence-boosting philosophy. No. This is our utter reliance upon the Lord's strength and might, not our own. Indeed, we would not be able to stand up against the enemy without God's strength. If you are unfamiliar with the letter to the Ephesians, then it's opening two chapters. Paul unpacks the reasons for people to trust in the Lord and in His mighty power. In chapter 1, he explains all the blessings and the securities that the believer can have in Jesus Christ. We are chosen by God. We are loved by God. We've been forgiven by God, reconciled by God. We are blessed by God. We are made holy by God. We've been adopted into God's family and are given a guarantee through His Holy Spirit that we will be kept by God until the day of our redemption. In fact, so certain is our place in heaven that God has even reserved a seat for us in the heavenly realms. That's what he says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6. I don't know how many of you have ever been to a, a wedding where you can't remember if you filled in the part that said, I'm not just coming to the wedding, I'm actually coming for the meal afterwards. And so you're sheepishly standing there looking over the seating plan just to see if your name's there. Uh, this happens to me a lot, by the way, because I've got a terrible memory. And I must admit, I'm so relieved. I've been togged up. I'm all dressed up. My wife's with me. Ah, Colin and Vicki Webster. We're on there. Don't worry. I clearly must have filled it in. That's what God is doing here in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6. God has seated us with him in the heavenly realms. So sure is your place in heaven. And it's all because of what Jesus achieved for the believer through his death and resurrection. It isn't by our good works that we have been saved, but by Christ's good and finished work on the cross. It is by grace we've been saved through faith in Christ. And we win in the end because he has won. Well, dare I say it, I don't know if you've been watching England in the Euros, uh, in the football tournament, but you will be aware that we have been living on something of a knife edge. Scotland's knife edge was never a knife edge. I knew that we would fail. But the matches have been really uncomfortable to view, haven't they? We feel nervous and worried. Are they going to make it? Will they do enough? But what if you knew the outcome of the game and that your team would win in the end? How would that change your mood? Well, if you knew for sure that your team was definitely going to win, then no matter how bleak things appeared, even if your team was 3-0 down, if you know your team's going to win in the end, then you could confidently rest assured that there was no need to panic or worry. Actually, there is one minister in America that does that. He he watches his football games, records them, watches the end bit, sees that his team wins, then winds it all the way back to the beginning and sits down with his popcorn and enjoys the whole game. No matter how drastic it looks, he says, we're going to win. Well, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead is like that. It makes absolutely clear that the war on Satan has been ultimately won. And therefore, we fight this battle from a place of victory, Christ's victory. It was won when Jesus paid for our sins, conquered death, and rose from the grave. And for you personally, it was won when you entered into His victory by placing your faith in Christ and in His sacrifice for your great and many sins and accepted Him as your Lord and Savior. If you, friend, have truly done that, then you stand on the winning side. That's why the Apostle Paul wrote elsewhere in Romans 8, verses 38 and 39, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, 
nor any powers, neither height nor depth or anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is found in Christ Jesus our Lord. Friends, that is an encouraging truth to hold on to. That no matter what else happens to you whilst you are here on earth, no matter how bleak things might appear in your life, even right now, you win because Christ won. Nothing will be able to separate you from the love of God that is found in Christ Jesus our Lord. But let's read on, verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, and against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Friends, Scripture is very clear. It t tells us that we are in a three-fold battlefield against the world, against the flesh, and against the devil. For there is a genuine spiritual battle in this world against invisible yet real forces of evil that stand opposed against God and His people. Now, this spiritual battle can manifest itself in numerous ways. It might be the subtle ways that perhaps governments or societies or individuals try and impose laws, regimes, or ways of living that stand contrary to everything that God regards as being good and holy. Indeed, currently we are living in a day and age where there are some laws in this land that go directly against the desires of God. And this often means persecution against Christians who dare to speak out for God's values. But as well as external influences in the world, the Christian uh, life is also an internal battle with the flesh. When we become Christians, we don't just have one nature. People outside of Christ only have one nature, a sinful nature. But the moment you, be you become a Christian, God's Holy Spirit dwells within you, and He gives you a new nature, one that leans towards God. But we still have the old sinful nature present there too. And Paul speaks of that in second, uh, 1 Corinthians, uh, 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 in Romans 7. But we wage against a war against the sinful nature within us. The gravitational pull of which, if we let it, will lead us further away from God's plans and desires for us. Now, nobody is temptation-proof. There's certainly enough evidence of moral failure within the church to confirm this. Even mature Christians have weaknesses in their character that make them vulnerable to a wounding attack by the enemy. So being aware of our own internal weak spots, be they lust, pride, greed, or whatever, will help us to become more alert to defend and protect that area of vulnerability within our life. Well, Paul goes on to say this, verse 13, therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you might be able to stand your ground and after you've done everything, to stand. Now, the day of evil, which Paul is speaking of here, can be pretty much any day for any believer at any time. Indeed, even this week, the enemy might be seeking an assault against you. Any day of trouble or immense temptation or deep darkness or depression or severe illness, 
any one of those could be the day of evil for you. And it may be a prolonged season where you feel under a particular attack for a long period of time. It could be that the devil is trying to stir up doubts in our hearts or making us feel worthless or stirring up divisions within the church. And that's all because we're in a war zone. We can come under attack at any time. Now, by the way, we are never, ever told to go and pick a fight with the devil. There are some churches that try and teach that, but trust me, you are not to do that. That is not something the Bible encourages us to do. However, we are told to take our stand against the enemy when he picks a fight with us. And Paul speaks of the resources to help us do that. Look at verse 14 again. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So we're to stand, but we're to stand armed with the armor of God. Now, no doubt Paul was thinking about the armed Roman soldiers uh, as his illustration here. Uh, for his illustration of the armor of God, he, he starts off with the belt of truth. But, but by the way, in essence, if you like all of the armor of God, simply amounts to this. It's simply believing and standing firm in the gospel truth of about your salvation. That's what all of the armor essentially is. It's standing firm in, your gos in the gospel truth about your salvation. But let's look at it. The belt of truth. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. You know, in his autobiography, Frank Collins, who was a former member of the British SES, recounts how the SES gave you a belt made of webbing full of pouches. It weighed 40 pounds. It contains ammunition, rations, and medical supplies. It is a survival kit. And the rule of the SES is quite simply this. No matter who you are, no matter where you are, no matter what you're doing, you never take that belt off. Never. Not even at night when you're asleep. In Burleys, a soldier took it off once. And the very next morning, he was discharged from the SES because he broke the golden rule. That belt is your survival kit. Well, for the Roman soldier, the belt was an essential piece of equipment. It held, really, everything else on. It held the breastplate on. It attached his sword to it. It, it kept his garments out of the way when he was in combat. It was a foundational garment. Lose that, and you lose everything. And that's why Paul likens the belt of truth in this way. Make sure of all the gospel, uh, uh, being sure of all that the gospel message is declaring over you. That is truth from God. It stops you from listening to the lies of the world and the lies of the devil and the lies even within your own heart. Your own emotions can sometimes fool you. But listen to God's pure truth, the belt of truth speaking into your life. Friends, the gospel is truth. But if a person doubts its truth, their armor will slip and they will become an easy target for the enemy in the battle, both against intellectual arguments about their faith and also morally in discerning what's right and wrong 
in life. If we lose sight of the gospel truth. At one of the Church of England, England Lambeth conferences way back in the 1990s, one African bishop stood up and challenged the liberal wing of the Church of England by saying this, you came over to our country 150 years ago and gave us a Bible and we believed it. But now you're telling us the Bible isn't true. You see, liberal churches are impoverished spiritually because they have abandoned the truths of the gospel so that they don't preach the gospel of salvation from sin because their definition of sin is not the same as the Bible's. And some don't think people need to be rescued from hell because they don't believe in a hell to be rescued from. And they think that we all end up there in heaven anyway, regardless of our religion or persuasions. We, friends, are to believe the truth of what God says in this book and not listen to the liberal theologians. Secondly, the breastplate of righteousness. Well, the Roman breastplate covered the front and the back. It protected the vital organs, as it were. And Paul says in Philippines that he has a righteousness that is not his own, but that which comes from Christ. Christ is our righteousness. He has declared us right before God. Yes, even our foul, dirty hearts can be declared right before God if we are in Christ. He qualifies us to enter heaven. And knowing this protects us from Satan's condemnation to our heart when he tells us, you're a failure. Well, listen, I already knew I was a failure. That's why I needed Jesus. I am wrapped and robed in Christ's righteousness. He moves on to the shoes of the gospel. Now, one of the important things a soldier needs to know in battle is this. What on earth is the mission plan? Because it's hard to fight when you don't understand what is my mission, what is my purpose of my mission. Our mission is the spreading of the gospel of peace. That's what it says here. He says, your feet should be fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. Because, friends, Jesus doesn't just call us to come to him, but to go for him. To go out into the, the highways and byways, different parts of the world, as we've been praying for uh, some of our overseas workers. The missionary Theodore Williams said this, we face a humanity that is too precious to neglect. We know a remedy for the ills of this world too wonderful to withhold. And we have a Christ too glorious to hide. And we have an adventure that is too thrilling to miss. And we go with a Jesus who says, I am with you always, even to the very end of the age. That is our mission, to go and tell. And that's why I love the sign outside a church in America, which has this sign as the congregation drive out from their, their car park saying this, you are now entering the mission field. That is a great saying to have in your mind as you even leave here this evening. Because you are to be a bearer of good news of Christ to whoever God is going to place in your path tomorrow. You are his ambassadors. You are his mouthpiece to a dying world. This is why it's important that we learn to proclaim the gospel clearly to others. Perhaps through your own testimony or by carrying around a gospel tract for someone to read 
or an invitation to something like a curious course. Well, moving on to the shield of faith. Verse six, in addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. You know, Roman soldiers uh, had shields made of wood covered in leather. They were almost as tall as the soldiers themselves, offering a full protection for the whole body. The leather covering uh, offered protection, but it especially offered protection when they soaked their shields in water to help extinguish the flaming arrows of their enemies who would be firing at them. And this is what Paul had in mind regarding our faith, the shield of faith. It guards you, guards your body. You know, the great preacher and theologian, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, was once asked this, what is the definition of faith? And Lloyd-Jones simply said two words, believing God. If you want to know a very brief definition of faith, it's believing God. That's what Hebrews 11 talks about, believing God in faith. The passage about people who had faith and who did incredible things because they believed God. They believed in His power, His might, His majesty, His promises, His plans, His provision, and His ability to fulfill those plans even through weak vessels like them. They believed God more than they believed in themselves, which is a good thing. Faith in God enables you to endure, you see. Faith enables you to trust Him even when it seems as though He is distant and everything around you is bleak and dark and disorientating. Faith is trusting God when you can't see the way ahead. It reminds me of a helicopter ride I did uh, in Aberdeen from the oil rig back to shore. We had been lifted off the rig in absolutely appalling weather. And by the time we actually approached the heliport uh, in Aberdeen, we couldn't even see any of the lights of Aberdeen. We knew we were in trouble because the pilots stopped talking to us. They were silent. They were concentrating on their instruments because it was so pitch dark and such a thick fog had, uh, uh, had surrounded the, the whole uh, cabin of the, the helicopter that you could not see a thing. We were all silent too. I dare say there was no atheists at that moment in time as they were coming in to land. But the only way we could land is because those pilots were relying on their cockpit instruments only. Because their radar system could see what their eyes couldn't see. You know, it's still the hardest thing for any pilot to do is to not trust with their eyes, but simply to trust the instruments before them because it's humanly natural for us to want to trust only that which we can perceive for ourselves. Well, in a way, that's what biblical faith is. When you're in your dark times, when you feel you cannot see a way ahead, God cuts through all that. He sees the beginning from the end. He sees everything. And He asks you to trust Him to let each foot go steadily one in front of the other, relying on Him. Perhaps the most challenging times for any believer is when, of course, they're faced with death. You know, if a Roman soldier fell in battle, his shield was used to carry him off the battlefield like a stretcher. And that's why Paul's picture of the shield of faith is so powerful. Because in life we live by our faith in the Lord Jesus. 
but also in death. For we will be carried off the field of this earth by our faith in the Lord Jesus, who will carry us to his side. Yes, even in death, our shield of faith will carry us off the battlefield and into the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. I think of one of our church members called Costa, who had terminal cancer. He wrote the following text message a few days before he died. I've been told I have weeks to live now, but that's okay. That's okay. Then he quoted words from that song, 10,000 Reasons to Bless the Lord. The final verse. And on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near and my time has come. Still my soul will sing your praise unending. Oh, 10,000 years and then forevermore. Oh, friends, I have seen the faith of a number of our fellowship here who faced death and illness and age and found their faith in Christ to be a solid rock and a strong defense in the face of our, their adversity. And that faith in Christ carried them off the battlefield into Christ's presence. Hallelujah. Then the helmet of salvation. God's salvation is the ultimate assurance and protection for us, knowing that I am his and he is mine, and that nothing can separate us from the love of God that is found in Christ Jesus. Nothing can snatch us out of his hand. Oh, that is a great assurance, friends, to be walking through life with. I like the way that Charles Spurgeon said. He said this, that he was so certain of his salvation that he could grab a dry uh, uh, corn stalk and swing it over the very fires of hell and look at the devil straight in the eye and sing, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. I'm looking forward to meeting Charles Spurgeon in, in, in heaven. He's got a good sense of humor. But assurance of your salvation will protect the believer from doubts. And make him or make the person who, who has that assurance a stronger witness. It will prevent us from playing the game, he loves me, God loves me not, God loves me, God loves me not. Friends, you're not saved today and lost tomorrow. He doesn't love you today and hate you tomorrow. Our faith is certain Christ died for us to be with him. Wear your helmet of salvation, that assurance. Because doubt is one of the first things that the enemy wants to sow in your life. That is almost certainly his first frontline attack on any new believer. He says, are you really saved? Well, for the seasoned believer, he may take a slightly different tactical approach. He may say, what about this in your life? Has God really forgiven you for that? Well, friends, you can snuff all that out with a helmet of salvation. Salvation means you're saved. It's an assurance of everything God wants the believer to have in Christ. And finally, the word of the Spirit. Now, this is the only part of the armory that could actually be used for attack as well as defense. Everything else up to now has been defense. But the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. Do you remember when Jesus was tempted by the devil in the wilderness? He, defeat, he defended himself with what? With the Word of God. And he told the devil on each attack, it is written. 
God says this. And therefore, when I am under attack, and when you are under attack, we should resort to the word of the Lord and look at his promises. If the devil tells me I'm not forgiven, I turn to the word of God and find that I am. If he tries to surround me with darkness and my soul saying God's abandoned you, again, to, I turn to the word of God and I can see that he will never leave me nor forsake me. Friends, when it comes to God's opinion or the devil's opinion, please, please, always believe God's opinion because the devil is the father of all lies. And God doesn't lie. And finally, prayer is, is essential. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. And with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all of the Lord's people. I dare say that you, like me, from time to time, might occasionally get a burden to pray for someone. Is that, I don't know if that's happened to you, but I suspect it does. You, someone comes into your mind and you think, I think I'm supposed to pray for them. Well, do. Because when that burden grows, then it's usually a sure sign that God is telling you to pray for them because there might be a need in their life. God knows their need, and your prayers might be part of that need, part of their, their lifeline as you call upon Lord, the Lord for them. And that's what Paul knew as he sat there in prison when he was writing this letter. He needed their prayers. And this is especially true that we should be praying for those involved with evangelism or direct mission work. Friends, they definitely need our prayers. Well, finally, and this really is finally, if you like, the, the armor of God has its relation directly in Christ, hasn't it? Because Jesus is a picture of the whole armor of God. We're told in John 14, 6, that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. We're told that he is our righteousness. We're told in Ephesians 2.14 that he is our peace. We're told in Galatians 2.20, his faithfulness makes our faith possible. We're told in Matthew 1.21, he is our salvation. We're told in John 1 verses 1 and 14, he is the word of God. So friends, how on earth is it that we can stand with all that the world, the flesh, and the devil throw at us? The answer is confidently, if you have Jesus. He is all the armor you will need. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for its truths. We thank you for the wisdom that you inspired Paul to write these words to us here today, 2,000 years on from when he first penned it. Its truths are relevant to our situation as it was for Paul's. Lord, help us if we have neglected to wear the full security of the armor of God. Help us to do so even in this coming week to reaffirm all of these truths so that we may make our stand against the enemy and that we might be in a better position to carry forth to others the good news and liberating news of Jesus Christ our Lord. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.